I'm Apostle T.B. Walker, and I want to just welcome you once again to Disciples of Faith Global Outreach, where we are reaching the world one share at a time. Uh, it's five o'clock and it's Wednesday, so you know exactly what time it is. It is live at five. We had a couple problems. So we were on at five, but you weren't getting it. So, but we're back. We're here now. So I want to make sure that you get this. This is the midweek infusion. We're here to not only give you some empowerment uh, in the middle of this week, to not only take you throughout the week, to give you something to chew on, give you something to contemplate, to think about, but also to walk in. Uh, I want to read something to you out of the book of John, chapter number six, and uh, we're going to just look at one verse. Uh, that's verse number 63. Then we're going to get directly into the three questions that have been posed uh, to me for this week. Uh, these are excellent questions, and I'm so glad that you're here uh, to be able to even to hear these questions and to be blessed by the questions, but also, I, I believe, by the answers. Don't forget, you know, we want you to share. So we, please make sure you just press that share button because we want to make sure we get as much of this divine Christian education out to God's people in this huge time of need. You know, as much as we are, you know, in this internet age, there is a famine of divine Christian education uh, in the hands of God's people. We aren't looking. It's there. And so I'm not saying it's not there. It is just that it's a famine in a sea of, of spiritual food. And that's a shame. It's kind of what the scripture is actually talking about here in John chapter 6, verse 63. I'm going to read this to you out of the NLT version. And it reads, the spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Now, you know, looking at the scripture, Jesus continually, and, and this was a hallmark of his ministry. No matter what he did, no matter where he was, Jesus was constantly challenging and confronting the thoughts of people, the thoughts of the people, you know, the, the, the way that they were thinking before. Here's what you thought. Here's what I say. So when you begin to look at this, this chapter makes it very clear that following Jesus was completely different than any of them had anticipated. And I suspect that that's the way it is now, that there's so many challenges that come in, in confrontations to who we are and to what we think being a Christian is all about, that we constantly feel challenged. And many people run from that. Many people move away from those challenges because we like to have it the way we want it. I want to serve God how I want to. I want to think about him in the way that I want to. Yet Christ comes and he tells us something totally different. He's constantly calling us to view, to our, look at our hearts and our focus and make sure that it is placed on spiritual realities and not on material things. You know, much of the struggle that people had then and they have now is some of the physical analogies that Christ uses. You know, when you begin to look at this chapter, one of the things that Jesus talks about is that he uh, counted himself as the bread of life. And, and he even says, uh, insists, as a matter of fact, that only those who eat his flesh and drink of his blood will actually obtain eternal life. And many of the people freaked out about that. Jesus would earlier, in an earlier conversation, Jesus mentioned that the, the bread of life was a person that actually came down from heaven. Now, first of all, the bread of life being a person and them thinking in terms of earthly human things, uh, there was no way they could comprehend it. Their view was that, is he talking about cannibalism? And how can he be the bread of life coming down from heaven? Because they said, we know where you come from. We know your mother. We know your father. And Jesus says, makes a statement here that is so important, you know, that lets them know you were not supposed to take this literally. This was, this was not something literal. This was, the idea was, not only was he saying, well, you didn't take this grammatically correct. You know, this was this. You didn't handle the, the the sentence syntax correctly. That's not just what he was saying. He was simply saying you don't actually have the spiritual mind required to receive what I'm actually telling you. He says the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. And he doesn't say the Holy Spirit. He he adds that they are spirit, meaning that they are spiritual. And, and you know why? You know why he says that? He says that these are spiritual. And not only is he making a statement that what he's saying is something that has to be divined by the spirit, but he's actually saying these are spiritual, which are in opposition to earthly, fleshly thinking. You can't receive it. Why? Because it's spiritual. Well, then what do I need to do? You need to get on a spiritual plane. You've got to be able to see the things of God 
being by being born again. The Lord comes and he tells Nicodemus, you there's no way unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of heaven. You can't perceive it. You can't conceive of it. And so when, when he begins to speak, he says, I get why you don't understand. And I want you to understand why you're not understanding this. The reality is you're not following me to receive these spiritual things. You're looking for food, but you're only looking for things that strengthen your body. You're only looking for things that fill up your pockets. You're only looking for things that make you your life better. You're not looking for things that will lead you to eternal life, nor are you seeking things that would make your soul come alive. See, listen, when we eat natural food, natural food, first of all, has to be ingested. Just touching it is not going to give you any nourishment, but you have to eat it. You have to ingest it. And the very same thing that Jesus is talking about here is that as earthly food supports your body, but it is no good unless it's absolutely inside you. It is the very same thing about being born again and about faith. Unless it's inside of you, it is not about intellectual knowledge. It has to be received absolutely. Bread, in order for it to have any kind of physical effect, has to be received. The knowledge that it's there, the knowledge that I see it, does not in any way make your body better or stronger. And listen, I want you to be able to see this. Jesus is talking about being able to consume the word. He said, listen, you're not being nourished by it because you're not being consumed by it. You're not, you're not being consumed by the word and you're not consuming the word. The word itself is a consuming fire. You're not in that fire and therefore you're not even eating the meal that's prepared in the midst of that fire. You have intellectual knowledge, a form of godliness, but no power. So when you begin to look at this, I want you to see what Jesus does here. You know, there are people who are seeking Christ today, you know, because they just want a better life. They just want to be out of what they're in right now. They need to get out of these bad relationships, you know. I mean, and Christ, that would be great to actually start something new with Christ. I live in a dangerous neighborhood. I live, you know, I'm, I'm under terrible circumstances and situations, and Christ may be the answer to that. Listen, I want you to understand something, and I want you not to be afraid to do what Jesus does and what Jesus did here. He made sure that he did not encourage people in any way to follow Christ or to follow him, for that matter, for any temporal purposes. Don't follow me for any kind of earthly motives. Don't follow to make your life better. The truth of the matter is Jesus was telling the people this was not about promoting a better life. This was about promoting eternal life. So I hope that you understand a charge that we have. You know, I, I believe that we're, going, we're coming into a time where people are going to flock to knowledge and they're going to flock to the church even for knowledge. And when I say the church, I mean, I, I don't mean necessarily the building, but people are watching things on the internet. People are coming and talking to people because they want knowledge. And many of us are just so excited because someone asked a question about knowledge and, and but never about their soul. They wanted a life change. They wanted a neighborhood change. They wanted a financial change in their life. You know, they may have wanted a physical change, a geographic change, but they never talked about a spiritual change. And many of us get caught up because we get so excited that somebody says Jesus. We get so excited that somebody actually sounds like they want to change. And we miss the idea and we start encouraging people to seek God for that better job. We start encouraging people to seek God, you know, for the test results, you know, and then when you go into the hospital tomorrow, seek God to make sure the surgery goes exactly as it's supposed to go. And we forget that that's not why you seek the Lord. We seek the Lord because we need a new life, not a better life. We, David said, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. We need him to literally do a makeover. So let's not encourage people to come to an ATM machine. Let's encourage people to come to a God who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Listen, I hope that midweek infusion was a blessing for you. Hope you received that because part of that is a charge. There's some revelation there that I want you to receive, but I really want you to receive the charge that's there that God is giving us as his people. Not to look at, you know, as people are coming and saying, I need a job. Well, let's pray. Let's pray that you get your life together with Christ, that you get right with God and all these other things 
shall be added unto you. Let's look at the questions because we've got three really good questions here that I want to make sure I get to today. Uh, well, I'm going to get to those questions because I've committed to, to those. Uh, these are questions that have been sent to me some time ago, and uh, and but I've alerted the people who sent these. I'm answering your questions today, so I hope you're on. Hope you're watching this. That's why sharing is so important. We want to make sure that people get this. But I want to read your question. Question number one. I am a Christian evangelical who works with those suffering from behavioral disorders and other forms of mental illness. As a professional, I have witnessed many people in the church who have been called demonically possessed who are in fact mentally ill. Is it a Christian doctrine that mental illness is demonic? Okay, so let's, let's tackle that. Uh, first off, the Bible makes it very clear that uh, there's no doubt that demonic uh, oppression, demonic possession actually is real and that diseases are there. Matter of fact, one of the, the one of the missions and the joint mission that Christ gives his disciples is to cast out uh, demons and to heal the sick. I'm going to read it for you. It reads, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom and to heal the sick. Now, so we, we, we recognize that, that yeah, de de demonic possession is real. So, you know, if you've seen it, uh, you're seeing the real, if, you know, if you have discernment and if you have some knowledge here, you're seeing the real thing. But to your question, uh, and I think to your point, there is a distinction between that mental illness and demonic possession. And the Bible makes a distinction as well. I want you to see this in 2 Samuel. There is a separate understanding of mental illness. Uh, this is in 2 Samuel, uh, and, and it's in starting at uh, chapter 21, and in, it's, it's verses 13 through 14. And here's what it says. So he pretended to be insane in their presence, and while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the door and of the gate, letting saliva run down his beard. Achish said to his servants, look at this man. He is insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Now, this is King David, and he was afraid that he was going to be killed at this time, so he acted like he was a madman. And when you look at the response of the people, there was nobody that responded and said, you know what, there's a possibility here that he's demonically possessed. No, they were well aware that he was acting insane, or at least they thought he was insane. There was a difference here that was dealt with with insanity and, and, and madness, which is what it was called here, uh, versus demonic possession. Now, I want you to see a key figure, key feature here in demonic possession that I think you'll see in the New Testament that kind of separates and lays out a difference between demonic possession and mental illness. And, and, and there's, a distinguishing, there's some distinguishing marks here. If someone's possessed, one of the things you're going to see is that in almost all the cases that you'll see of someone that is possessed by the de by a demon or by the devil, they always know Jesus they, and they recognize him as the son of God. I want to read something to you. It says in the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. Right. It's clear that this person is demonically possessed. He cried out at the top of his voice. Oh, what do you want with us? Jesus of Nazareth. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Luke 4, 41. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the Son of God. Now, I want you to see that. They recognize who he was. Now, there are some things with that, that happened with uh, schizophrenia, many uh, type of severe bipolar disorder disorders, behavioral disorders that are there that oftentimes will be very similar to some things that you'll see uh, with mental illness. You know, when you have the man who li who was living in the tombs, he was uh, cutting himself and, and no one could actually handle him. This was actually the first documented place, at least in the Bible, of self-harm, uh, which you see with, in mental illness all the time with people who are cutting themselves. And at the end of the scripture dealing with this man who was uh, filled with demons, who was living in the tombs, um, in the cemetery, howling, all night long, chain, but breaking chains, you know, just with supernatural strength. The Bible ends this with, it says, and he was sitting there clothed in his right mind. He was dressed and in his right mind. So was he mentally ill before that? 
Well, let's look at a defining feature again. Look, look how Mark records it. I want you to begin to see this. The, a, Mark records the man as saying, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you will not torture me. Right? He says, have you come to cast me out? Cast us out before the time? So recognizing here that there is a distinction between mental, mental illness and there is a clear distinction between uh, demonic possession and mental illness. And, you know, listen, here's what I want to say in the answer to that. Mental illness um, is a medical problem, just like diabetes, just like uh, heart disease. There, there, are, there, are no, there are no more demonic people who have mental disorders or no more demonic than someone who has lupus or who uh, has cancer. You know, these are medical issues. Now, of course, one of the things about mental illness, because it gets mixed up so often, there, there's a great deal of stigma. And many of the people are stigmatized, stigmatized. Now, one of the things that I want you to get and understand this, every illness, whether it is a mental illness, whether it is a uh, physical illness, however the illness is there, it's a result of the fall of man. And it is a consequence of man's evil. It's a consequence. But it does not mean that someone who has a, a mental illness is a demon or is demonic. That's stigmatizing. And those who suffer mental illness oftentimes will suffer not only from the mental illness, but also from discrimination. They'll suffer that from the social exclusion. And oftentimes, as you were mentioning, misdiagnosis, that someone will say, you got a devil, you got a demon. When in truth, you're right. Many, some of these our mental illness. We've got to have our. We've got to have knowledge. We've got to study to show ourselves approved unto God that we are workmen, and this is a work that we have with mental with people who are mentally ill. We have a work. We have a work uh, of of eliminating the stigma, bringing them back into the church, and helping them to get the help that they need. We've got a work to do with those that have um, d demons. To make sure that we do the work that we have to cast out those demons. But no matter what, what it is, whether it is mental illness, whether it is demonic uh, depression or oppression or possession, no matter what it is, we have a role to exercise care and compassion toward all of those who are a part of this community. So listen, I hope that that helps because I, I think that you are right on point that we need to make a distinction. And part of the role in answering these questions, I wanted to give you some 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 skills, some some ideas and some understanding concerning what the demonic possession is all about. Because the devil is not there to make us mad. The devil ultimately is there because he's angry with God and knows that his time is short. And he may make us make people throw themselves into the fire. He may make people, you know, uh, speak in, in language that there's not even able to be understood. But one of the things that is always there is that the devil recognizes the authority, the power and the sovereignty of God. And the person who's possessed will, with the tr person in front of them with true power, will have to yield to the power of the Son of God. That's Bible. So hopefully that helps with that. Uh, let's, say, let's look at question number two. I, I'm really afraid of the government or some entity tricking me into getting the mark of the beast. What happens to my soul if I receive it accidentally or unknowingly? All right, mark of the beast. Let's look at Revelation chapter number 13. We're looking at verses uh, 16 through 17. Let me read this for you. It also, for, it also forced all people, great, small, rich, and poor, free, and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands, or on their foreheads so, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name, get this, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Now, one of the things we, we got to know about Satan is that he is a counterfeiter. Satan has spent, it looks like all his time, making every effort, effort to copy what Christ has done, what God himself has done. That's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We, we know that. Listen, if you look at the, the Trinity, I just mentioned the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, right? That is the Holy Trinity. Well, what do we see in the New Testament as it pertains to uh, uh, Satan? Well, we've got Satan, we've got the beast, and we've got the false prophet. We've got, again, a triune uh, head of evil that mimics the triune Godhead. You know, Jesus rose again from the dead. The great doctrine of his resurrection is what salvation is built around. As you will look at the Antichrist, you'll find out that the beast 
is portrayed as one who dies and is resurrected again. So there's a great deal of counterfeiting here. And what you have here with this mark of the beast is the very same thing. It is a counterfeit sign that is given to believers that is 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 put on their forehead. Let's, 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 let me give you another scripture. This is Revelations 9, 4. And here's what it says. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Wait a minute. God has a seal? After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who have been who have been given power to harm the land and the sea. And here's what he says. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of God. Let me just give you one more. This is Revelation uh, chapter 22, verse number four. They will see his face. This is the believer. And his name will be on their foreheads. Now, I want you to get this. There's absolutely no doctrine. There's, there's nothing out there. I don't think you're going to find anybody who believes that when we stand before God, we're going to have some tattoo uh, on our head. This is not, uh, there's not going to be, uh, this is not literal. There's not going to be a, 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 a figurative a way of thinking about this. Uh, there's not going to be an actual name of Jesus on our foreheads. There's, it's not going to be there. This is symbolism. And part of what this is designed to do is to describe those that are born again and redeemed by Christ. And it describes those that belong to him. It, it, it is an invisible mark. It's not a mark that, that men can see, right? It's, a, it's not something that people will look and say, oh, I can see you belong to Christ. Not now, not even, not then will that ever be. It is an invisible mark. It is a mark known by God. And that mark is a symbol of belonging to Christ and having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But if you have the name of the beast written on your forehead, right? What does that mean? Well, it's the same thing. It's not an actual mark that's going to be there. It is a. It symbolizes one thing. You are marked by the. You you belong to him. So just as we are marked by Christ now, you can't see his blood on our lives. You can't see our chosenness, right? You you don't know those that have been predestined before the foundation of the world. There there are certain signs, you know. There's discernment that we can use. But the truth of the matter is, it's nothing physical that you can see. Just as that's not physical, being born again, it's not something that can physically happen that Nicodemus tripped out over and said, well, how can I, I'm old, be, go, go back into my mother's womb. The same way that that was symbolism for him to understand what it meant, the same way it is with the mark of the beast. The satanic name symbolizes not only who belongs to Satan, but also who will undergo perdition. Who's going to go through tribulation and in the end, Flames and fire. So understand this. The mark of the beast has nothing to do with governments, has nothing to do with organizations, has nothing to do with vaccines, has nothing to do with uh, technology. None of those things. It's, symbol it's symbolic. Just as the lamb's mark, which the believer has, is something that is symbolic, that we're marked by Christ in a way that men can't see. Guess what? It's the very same thing, that those that are destined for hell also bear this name, this mark. And don't, there won't be people walking around with the name Satan on their forehead. So you can't be, you won't be tricked. The Bible talks, of, God is the keeper, right? I want you to understand something. Those that are his, he will keep us. The Bible says unto him that is able to keep us from falling and then present us faultless before God's glory. You have to understand that when, when Jude was talking about this, he recognized that there's going to be great, great uh, deception in the last day. But he gave glory to God that it was unto him that was able to keep us from this type of deception. So listen, stay in Christ, continue to read your word, and know this, that the Lord will not allow you to be ignorant of any of Satan's devices. You won't be tricked by the mark under no circumstances. You, those who have the mark will actually willingly give themselves over to Satan. Hopefully that helps you with that. 
And I know that there's some people, listen, get back in your word, get, get some study in it, because I'm sure that people that are looking and saying, no, 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 that mark of the beast is going to be, and people have been looking for 666. People have been looking for, I'm not going to take that because that's a chip and all those things. Listen. The one of the things you got to understand, and I, I'm going to go to our third question in just a moment. But one of the things you got to understand, if you're dealing with the mark, if you're dealing with that, you've missed the rapture. The thing you need to understand is that anybody who's the believer is not going. The believer living now, the believer that's going to be here during the church age, is not going to have to even deal with getting the mark. That's not going to be there. The, 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 so here's what you need to do: make sure that you either die in Christ or make sure that you are living for Christ so that if, if the rapture comes in your lifetime, that you'll be caught up with him and you won't have to deal with that. So the, the first part of that question helps answer that, but the second part seals that. Don't stay here. Don't get left here. All right, let's take a look at our last question. And this is a good question. Why did God support the law of retribution in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, Jesus opposes it? Is the New Testament correcting the Old Testament? Is Jesus schooling the Father, right? Is it, it's kind of like that. The law of retribution, the eye for an eye, a two for a tooth, a foot for a foot, right? We, we know about that law. And then in Matthew chapter 8, uh, chapter 5, verses 38 to 42, which is, I think, what you're talking about, the opposition, Jesus comes and says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other. And if anyone would, would uh, take your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Listen, I can, I can see the struggle with that. Uh, but you're not struggling with it because it is, uh, you know, I, I, I guess you have to submit to someone or that it, you know, may seem weak. That seems, doesn't seem like a struggle. Seems like your struggle is, is Jesus opposing uh, what was written in the Old Testament, right? If, 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 does he change? Is there, is there a change here in Scripture? Well, let's understand what the law of retribution is actually all about. The law of retrib retribution is really all about teaching justice. That's what it's actually about. The punishment has to fit the crime. Notice that it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that the compensation has to fit the offense. Why? Because you know how people are. The reality is what we look at is like, man, that, that was wicked in the Old Testament. Listen, you know your own heart that how many times do people, you know, they'll take one thing and people have said, I'll burn that whole house down. You mean because of what they stole? Does that, does that equate this person who cuts you off and you say, man, I wish I could kill them. So you would, your desire is to kill them because they cut you off. And like you didn't even get into an accident. It just was inconvenient. Well, when you begin to look at the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, you begin to look at God knowing here the heart of men and making sure that the amount of compensation that is paid that does not overcompensate for the actual injury. Listen, the, the principle here is a restriction on vengeance. It's not something where Jesus is now coming and saying, well, they were bad guys in the old days. No, it's actually the same doctrine all the way through with a little twist and not a change. I want you to understand something. Jesus is not schooling Moses here because Moses is the writer of this law. Remember, Moses is going before magistrates. He's actually going before people who are writing the law. He's going before civil administrators who are going to administer the law. And so Jesus, when he speaks, does not contradict this principle of, of punishment for wrongdoing. Absolutely not. That, that would actually up in every idea of civil justice, right? He's not absolutely doing that. But what he's doing is reminding his disciples that they must not always stand on their rights. And that's what a believer has to understand. Listen, you know, I mean, the I understand an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, means I have a right at compensation. I have a right to take you to court. I have a right to, listen, to get some payback. Right. If you did it to me, then I can do it to you. The law actually says that's right. I can't do any more or less, but I can do that. Here's what Jesus comes and says. I want you to understand something. You won't always be able to stand on your rights. When we talk about interpersonal relationships, when we talk about relationships. They have to be built for a believer on the spirit of forgiveness. 
A spirit of self-denial is what this is all about. And love actually towards an offender. So Jesus isn't like coming back and schooling. Jesus is actually now expounding on the love that was actually there from the beginning. It is God who simply says, you can't do more than that. It is God who sets up these, uh, these, these cities of refuge for people who, you know, who were running from justice, who felt like they weren't going to even get justice. The Lord was all about justice. But again, when you begin to look at what Jesus is about, he's not saying you don't have a right to do it. He's saying as a believer, we don't always stand on our rights. I have a right to say something back to you. But guess what? The Holy Spirit may actually say, no, don't say anything. I have a right to hit you back if you hit me. Jesus comes and says, that's not my mind. So yeah, you have a right to do it. I don't want you to stand on your rights. I want you to actually be above that and exemplify me. So when you begin to look at this, the Lord is actually talking about a spirit that rules in the believer's heart that is not the same as those that are dealing with codes of legal justice. We live by a, a, another law that exceeds even the laws that are about our rights. That's what you see, a continual elevation until we see exactly what Christ is trying to show us. Listen, I hope that this was informative for you, educational. I hope you enjoy this. You know, my, my hope is that you, you enjoy Christian education because I just believe that the most powerful believer is a believer who is educated in the word and principles of God. So listen, we'll be back here tomorrow again on Thursday for our Thursday Bible study at 730. But I hope you, you take in everything that you heard tonight. Hope that you're able to go back and do some studying on your own. There's some things that you agree with or you don't agree with. Listen, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, listen, I believe in scholarly debate, but we want to make sure that we're on the same page because part of what we want to do is we want to reach this lost world with the word of God for Jesus Christ. God bless you. Have an awesome Wednesday.